On June 26, 2004, an elusive unknown game developer going only by the alias of Kikiyama uploaded a file to the internet. This file was an RPG Maker video game dubbed Yume Nikki. This unknown developer would not know this, but this game would cause a butterfly effect across the entire world of video games. Almost every single RPG style game I have ever played can lend some form of inspiration back to Yume Nikki. Undertale, One Shot, Everhood, Omori, you name it. All of these beloved games have Yume Nikki to thank in some way for their creation. So today, I wanted to pay proper respects to that game. When Yume Nikki first came out, I wasn't even 10 years old. It was long before my time. 20 years later, I have taken it upon myself to solve the mystery known as Yume Nikki. I have scoured this game, looking for every clue, leveraging every interpretation, reading almost every single paragraph on the wiki, and watching several fan theories. This game is about dreams, so it goes without being said that things are about to get very interpretive. Dreams in general can have several meanings, so I wouldn't be surprised if my interpretations deviate from what you see in Yume Nikki. So, while I am drawing conclusions about the game for myself, you are more than able to pull separate interpretations. This game is a massive onion. A game of this size requires context. A lot of context. Well, would you look at the clock? Looks like it's adventure time, so come along with me, and I will take you through the story of Yume Nikki. Starting Yume Nikki will place you in a room, followed by absolute silence. All you can hear are the steps of your rubbery shoes on the floor, only ever muted by the rug which complements the room. Walking outside will bring you to a balcony and a black cloudy sky. The sky in the background will change from night to day occasionally. You play as a young girl named Madotsuki. This comes from the word Mado, which means window, and Tsuki, which means something that is attached. The naming of the protagonist directly leads into the idea of looking through a window, outwards. This understanding can be thought to be a direct representation of the character's actions, as Madotsuki will later be seen looking into many different worlds and places. This could also be a reflection of how she has lived looking out into the world, clearly seeing the events which take place while still being blocked from participating. Isolation is the soul of Yumaniki. And it's a game that makes you feel alone all the way through, with only some moments of reprieve. When you attempt to leave the room, Madotsuki refuses, shaking her head. The significance of simply shaking her head could also be made to imply the pointlessness of walking through that door. This area is commonly referred to as the real world. With the action of shaking her head, it could be understood that Madotsuki has given up completely on going outside, deciding to reserve herself to her room permanently. For the most part, Madotsuki's design is normal. Fashion sense is typically represented by the clothing a person wears, but in this context, the clothing has been chosen by the creator of the game. So therefore, I can only assume the clothing is symbolic. On her shirt lies a red square, and within this square we see a 6 pixel checkered pattern which doesn't really form anything specific. This checkered pattern actually resembles the checkered pattern seen in PNG images. Comprising of gray and white squares, these squares are never seen in the final image, as PNGs are typically used to allow other images to fill in the background. The implications behind this design choice are vast. This could mean that there is a sense of nothingness or emptiness within Madotsuki. Or perhaps there is a space where her heart would go, but you can see right through her and find nothing. Like I mentioned before, you are not supposed to see this checkered pattern in the final product of the image. So, the presence of this pattern could point towards something regarding how Madotsuki perceives herself. She might believe that there is a mistake deep inside her heart. This pattern could represent how Madotsuki feels like there is something wrong or incorrect inside her. You usually don't see the pattern unless the person making the PNG image has made a mistake. So, perhaps Madotsuki believes herself to be wrong in some way or even that there is something missing that was removed. A more outlandish interpretation to be honest. For the most part, people are more than likely to see this checkered pattern as an actual window, hence the name, Madotsuki. Going by the window interpretation, this design choice would imply that throughout the events of Yume Nikki, we are figuratively taking a look inside of Madotsuki's heart. 
The very nature of Yumeniki is unsettling. The silence you hear within Madotsuki's room is deafening. This silence might actually not be directly linked to Yumeniki itself. I have never been there, but I am almost certain that Japan has specific rules regarding noise levels. In Japan, it is very normal to have lawfully enforced quiet times, usually ranging from 10pm into the night. On places such as trains and buses, people are expected to remain quiet as to not disturb other people. This would track back to Madotsuki's nature, as any loud noise could potentially bring a complaint and social interaction that Madotsuki is trying to avoid. Across the room are several pieces of paper, at least I believe them to be paper. From what I can tell, these pieces are blank and can probably be traced back to the dream journal on the desk. At least, that's what I would say if there was anything actually on the desk. The place next to the bed is where you save your game, or in the game's own language, fill a page in your dream journal, your Yume Nikki. However, looking directly at the desk, there is no journal there. You see, there are quite a few logical inconsistencies in Madotsuki's room. Before we start the actual content of this game, I think the best place to start would be talking about the current living conditions of Madotsuki herself. People often refer to her as a hikikomori, which you would be familiar with if you ever played the game Omori, which bears a similar name. Social withdrawal is something I have a little bit of experience with. I don't want my personal experience to muddy up the interpretation too much, so... All I'll say is, from my experience, sometimes reclusiveness is better than the alternative. Sometimes I would reserve myself to my room with the door closed for hours on end, and I would only ever come out when it felt… safe, for lack of a better word. In this time of recluse, I would entertain myself with things like stories and playing video games. Madutsuki has found her own way of entertaining herself via her dreams, not necessarily because she likes it but she just might not have a real choice in the matter. The point is, while I think the label of Hikikomori is accurate, Madotsuki appears to be very young, unable to make the decision for herself. I don't think she can safely explore the outside world on her own, considering her age. Pixel art is notorious for being unclear at times, but just by looking at her sprite, I can only imagine that Madotsuki would only be like 14 years old at the most. A Hikikomori is a recluse who lives this way intentionally or out of necessity. Marutsuki's reclusiveness is technically voluntary, but with the way she shakes her head, I could imagine there is a good reason she does not want to walk outside that door. If she did so, she would be a lone child wandering the outside world by herself. This is not the end of my interpretation, by the way. The next piece of the puzzle requires context which comes far down the line, so please be patient. It'll all come together in the end, I promise. Next to the door is a TV and a Famtendo system, which is a combination of Nintendo and Famicom Disk System. The Famicom itself is actually an attachment to the Nintendo Entertainment System, one of Nintendo's game consoles which could be used to read disk media rather than a cartridge. That's floppy disk, by the way, not compact disk. Thankfully, I'm not old enough to remember these, but I guess these were these little square plastic discs that could hold media. This explanation is actually very important for identifying the exact time frame which this game takes place. If we were to use the era of the NES as a reference, we could easily place this game somewhere in the range of 1983 to 1993. Maybe a little bit afterwards. Not a small or accurate range, but I think it's good enough for now. The Famtendo system has a single game on it called Nasu, which means eggplants. The significance of eggplants in Japanese culture cite them as a symbol of good fortune, and more specifically, giving dreams of good fortune. Dreaming about eggplants is a sign of good luck, and it stems from a saying in Japanese folklore, which goes by something along the lines of, uh, let's see, Ichifuji ni taka san nasubi. First, Mount Fuji, second, a hawk, and third, an eggplant. If you dream of all these things, you will have good luck in the coming new year. Nasu is bare bones, but it's a game within a game, so what are you gonna do? Really, the way I see it, this game is about manifestation. If Madotsuki can catch virtual eggplants within this video game, then maybe she can bring good fortune to her life. Manifestation is the psychological concept of bringing ideas and thoughts into the real world by just envisioning them within your head. <laughs> Yay! 
Manifestation is mainly useful for setting goals and properly planning to achieve the goals you want. Well, that's it. This has been You May Nikki. I can see why people like it. It's pretty nice and wholesome, but I honestly did not expect it to be so short. I guess the only thing to do now is just take a nice dessert rest and enjoy a peaceful night of sleep. Welcome to the Nexus, a hub world filled with many doorways to many worlds. On occasion, these worlds also have pathways which lead to other, more deeper worlds themselves. This place is a dream, and the majority of this game takes place within a dream. So if you're like me, you're probably thinking, what the heck am I looking at? To be direct, you are looking at nothing. And this is where the analysis will truly begin. Let me take you into the world of dreams. <laughs> to start off, what are dreams? Well, we don't know, but like most things, we can guess really good. Dreams typically happen when you're asleep. It is possible to dream while you're awake, but that's typically regarded as just a hallucination. After allowing yourself to rest, you will enter a state of light sleep. No dreaming yet, but your consciousness is saying goodbye. Your eyes begin to move back and forth, and you start to breathe more slowly. Soon, your brain will start to produce delta waves, which are seen predominantly in moments of relaxation and deep sleep. Delta waves are also believed to be connected to memory consolidation, which is very important for the context of Yuminiki. The final stage of sleep is called REM sleep, or rapid eye movement sleep. Breathing becomes rapid and shallow, your muscles become paralyzed, and your brain begins to undergo several hallucinations in the form of, you guessed it, dreams. Most people dream anywhere from 3 to 6 times a night, but like 95% of dreams are forgotten. It is possible to remember your dreams more vividly by keeping track of the ones you do remember in a dream journal, just like Maratsuki. The actual objective purpose of dreams is unknown but we have a lot of really good guesses as to what it could be. The first is memory processing. Whenever your brain is given a large amount of new information or experiences, it needs the proper time to process them so they can be properly retained later. This is one of the key differences between short-term memory and long-term memory. Dreams are typically filled with neutral or positive events, and when you have dreams of negative events, those are typically called nightmares. Having terrifying thoughts during sleep can seem to be a bit counterintuitive. Some people believe the concept of nightmares is the brain preparing itself for future threats. This could also be why nightmares involve traumatic past experiences. The brain is trying to identify how and why these awful experiences happened, so they cannot happen again. We've come pretty far in the understanding of dreams. They help us develop our cognitive abilities, reflect on past events, and they allow us to work through traumatic experiences as a form of self-imposed therapy. There are many understandings for what the purpose of dreams could be. For this specific scenario, we are moving forward with the understanding that these dreams carry past memories. Madotsuki spends most of her time in her room, so it's safe to say that she isn't making any new memories. Whew, wow, when I say that out loud, it sounds very depressing. Okay, so going by that logic, we can understand that everything within Madotsuki's dreams can be traced back to her past life experience, or even her understanding of her past experiences. So, with that, we can go even deeper into the understanding of how dreams can help us understand ourselves. Something I should absolutely mention is that there are multiple scientific fields that seek to understand the inner interpretations of content within dreams. There is the side that is purely psychological, more specifically, psychoanalytics. And then you have the more biological side, which studies the biological responses when sleeping, and the measurement of how dreams affect people. Madotsuki is a character within a video game, so we have little knowledge of what is physically going on inside Madotsuki's head, or what her actual response is to these dreams. So, the majority of this analysis will be purely psychoanalytical. And of course, a big Nighthawk disclaimer. In the form of a poem. I am not an expert in psychology. I really, really like it, but school's not for me. I don't even have a bachelor's degree. I'm just a bird. 
You don't have to listen to me. Thank you. Thank you. So with all that being said, throughout this video, I will be analyzing almost everything seen within Madotsuki's dreams, from the visual understanding to the more psychological understanding, as I have interpreted it. Due to the nature of this game, the community no doubt already has several interpretations that can be ascertained, and I have no intention of saying that my interpretations are correct above others. Before we start exploring worlds, I want to cover at least two more topics. One concerning the overall appeal and structure of exploration games such as this, and how this game handles reality itself. When I played Yuminiki for the first time, it completely surprised me. I had a vague understanding of the game. All I really knew about it for sure is that it influenced a lot of games that I liked. I was 100% expecting a narrative story. I had no idea that there were RPG style games that were purely explorative. RPG style games have always had interesting worlds for you to explore, but I honestly never thought I would find one that was purely for exploration, just walking around and discovering things. Whenever you think of a typical RPG, you find one of two types of players. The super technical one who wants to use a game's systems to maximize their damage or even find a crazy way to break the game and make themselves overpowered. These are your typical RPG fans where they enjoy the gameplay aspects, you know, mechanics and stuff. What damage type is best to use against this enemy and how can I build my character to do maximum damage, that sort of thing. On the other hand, you have the more story-focused RPG fans, people who play the game mostly for the story. Yes, these games have mechanics, but most people remember them for the story. This isn't a binary thing, by the way. All of these aspects cross over all the time, and there are plenty of people who enjoy both mechanics and story. Most good RPGs actually benefit from both. Ultimately, it doesn't really care if you know it exists. It doesn't care if you find everything or if you quote unquote get the platinum trophy, the game is here. It will continue to be here when you leave and if you decide to come back, that's okay. There are no set goals for you to accomplish in Yumaniki. You can play it or not. It's up to you to decide what you get from the experience. Every journey into the many worlds of Yumaniki is filled with several uncertainties and in essence, that is exactly like the real world. Every door you enter can lead to your death either outside or into another room of your home. Forgive my grim forwardness, but everyone has a potential to die if they leave their home today. And while I hope that you don't, that is a possibility. It's unlikely, but the chance is there. Especially if I just so happen to decide to leave my home at the exact same time. <laughs> Stay safe out there everyone. Just like the possibility of being teleported to the staircase of hands or the possibility of meeting you Boa, the uncertainty of human Nikki matches the uncertainty of life wonderfully. And I think that is what draws people to exploration games like this. It's a gamble. You don't know what is going to happen and that level of uniqueness is what feeds into the natural and primal drive to discover things. All of us have this inherent need to find new things and understand them. Heck, why do you think I made this video? Curiosity, exploratory drive, whatever you want to call it, you have it. And Madotsuki has it as well. There are several places to go and explore, and there are several points in which there is nothing that happens. There is no overall goal of the game aside from collecting all the effects and, well, we'll get into that later. This game is a space, not like actual space, but it is a space where things technically don't exist. But you can still interact with this world in a limited sense. The way in which you interact with Yumaniki by design is limited. As with the RPG style and the limited view you have, there are aspects of this game you would never notice. Take Graffiti World for example, unless you knew how to look into the game files, you probably would not know that the entire world is a piece of art. The structure of this specific example almost feels counterintuitive. It's almost like this specific image was made for the developer and them alone, unaware that the game would eventually garner a cult following, making people interested in things like this. 
When Yumaniki first released in 2004, well, for starters, it wasn't even in English, but also, this image on the wiki did not exist back in 2004, and it really makes me think of how long it took people to realize that this whole thing was just one big piece of art. Sure, if you explored the game long enough, you would notice things like the face or the hands, but a brand new player would have no idea whatsoever. But, this always existed in the game. People just didn't know about it. Any typical game you play can be understood as its own separate plane of reality, complete with the game world's own set of rules, locations, and characters within. Yuminiki supposedly has a firm grasp of reality, but I am not so convinced. The way that reality is depicted in Yuminiki is comprised of the surface and then the inner dream world which is located beneath. If you want to get very specific, there are even lower areas found when you explore the deeper parts of Madotsuki's dreams. These are areas that have even more abstract imagery and potentially are the more difficult memories that Madotsuki would prefer not to dream about. The top level is where you start and see Madotsuki's room and a small glimpse of the outside world. The second level lies within one of the 12 doors where you find Madotsuki's base thoughts and dreams. These worlds are typically filled with an assortment of simple objects, and you can't get to more specific areas unless you travel into deeper areas from these worlds, almost as if Madotsuki is traveling down a thought process to remember her deeper memories. This is the basic understanding of how the game handles reality and I kinda have an issue with it. If this area here is the quote-unquote real world, then why all of the inconsistencies? For starters, why is there no notebook on Madotsuki's desk? I initially thought it was one of those tables that open up, but no, I don't think it is. I don't see a hinge or drawer, so where is the dream journal? Also, if Madotsuki never travels outside, then why does this random pedestal just appear on the balcony after we find all of the effects? Items that are supposed to be here are not, and items that were not here initially appear out of nowhere. While I don't have all of the context to make my argument just yet, I think the ending to this game is a lot more cheerful than it may seem. And yes, unfortunately the ending of this game was spoiled for me, but that's okay. What I do know for sure is that there is technically a level of reality that is above the game, and that is ours. Our reality. Yumeniki exists in our reality, albeit digitally. I mentioned earlier how a video game can have its own sense of reality, and I think the big question we can get from Madotsuki's many adventures is, just because a dream is not physical, does that mean it is not real? We naturally forget 95% of our dreams. If our brain doesn't remember them, are they really not worth talking about? I say no. A dream can invoke an emotional response, and it can be used to process emotions of events long past. Just because their nature is elusive and illogical does not mean they do not deserve to be pondered and valued. Dreaming is a brief gateway into oblivion, where anything can exist, and we get a little taste of it every time we say goodnight and briefly leave our reality. For a third of our entire lives, we will be asleep. Or at least we should be asleep. I know some of you be staying up too late. Yeah, I'm looking at you person who's watching this at 2 o'clock in the morning. What are you doing? You probably have some very important stuff to do tomorrow. Save your spot in the video and go to sleep. It's important for your health. Tell me what you dreamed about in the comments down below. <laughs> now that all of that philosophical stuff is out of the way, we can finally get into the content of this game. This game took me by surprise with its explorative nature and I completely underestimated how big this game was. I thought that I could just explore this game aimlessly and eventually figure out the story as I went along. I was wrong. I decided not to do it this way because of what happened during my first expedition into the world of Yumeniki. This is what happened. I wake up and I walk over to the TV. By activating it, I get pulled into what is called the Kalimba TV event which is one of the many events which has a chance to happen in this game. After leaving this event, I turned the TV back on to see a single eye staring at me. I started my expedition through Yuminiki with the numbers world. The world of numbers is filled with, well, numbers, all strewn about the floor. I have some knowledge of the game at this point, but I am still trying to learn the layout of the worlds. 
At this point, I have some of the basic effects like the lamp, the knife, and the cat, among others. I find myself by a door that is being blocked by this wheelie creature. Still pretty new to the game, I am under the impression that the only way to get it to move is to stab it with the kitchen knife effect, which I do. I thought to myself, well, at least it's just one, I guess. This room is called the stabbing room, and before you ask, no, I'm not proud of this. And yes, every single one of them made the exact same scream. This game is very disturbing at times. I find what appears to be a blue mask, almost akin to a plague doctor's mask, at the end of the hallway. I make my way out and then decide to continue my journey to the left of the numbers world. I bob and weave through these beds and I notice one of them is empty. So, I hop inside. This transports me to the staircase of hands. Apparently, this event has a 1 in 5 chance of happening, so I guess I'm pretty lucky. Moving up the staircase will see you move out, but moving down will eventually bring you to the underground world, which is unnecessarily foreboding. I decided to take my chances and get into the elevator. This elevator brings me to this area which is called the mall. I guess luck was still on my side because I chose to take the up escalator rather than the down one. I guess the path I took has a chance of being blocked off. The up escalator takes me to the roof of the mall. This area is a lot more upbeat than the mall below, so I guess it's a good thing that I decided to stay up here for a while. Hey look at that, it's some kind of mountain off in the distance. I wonder if that's Mount Fuji, like the folklore tale, remember? That looks like a good sign. Hey, maybe all of Madatsuki's dreams aren't all bad. Inside the mall, all you hear is a constant hum of clanking metal, as if work is being done somewhere, but you can never find it. All the way on the far left side of the mall, I find E-Man and Oh man. Interacting with the nearby flute gives you the flute effect, and by using it, you can have Madotsuki play one of five assorted sounds. I decided to play along with Oh Man for a while. It was at this very moment, I felt that I was actually a part of the world rather than just a foreign explorer making their way through. The sensation was fleeting, but I was enjoying myself, so I decided to keep going. Traveling all the way to the right had me meet this blocky fellow. When I decided to interact with him, he tipped over and a red liquid started to spill onto the floor. The right hand side of the room has this red pool which looked identical to the block creature. You have the ability to sit on the chair in that room, so I decided to do just that and ponder what the significance of the red liquid was. I sat there for a while and I actually did not come to a conclusion, so I decided to leave under the assumption that this area required more context. The mall shoppers don't seem to be interested in conversation, so I decided to continue down the escalator. There, I found a tunnel. Going down this tunnel led me to a forested area, which was heavily blocked off. The area itself is nothing special aside from the frog, which gives you the frog effect. Out of the corner of my eye, I noticed something at the bottom of the screen. There was this road, and there was a man in that road that looks like he suffered from some sort of traffic accident. I could not reach him, but I knew he was there, so I decided to keep going. On the other side of this forested area, I found a red jellyfish. Interacting with the jellyfish made a slight chime sound, and this sent me to what is known as the teleport maze. I realized at that point that this game was big, and we aren't even in the deepest echelon yet. The teleporting maze is exactly what it sounds like. I was too proud at the time to use a guide, so I decided just to, well, mindlessly run through the maze like an idiot. I finally make it to the exit, and after all of my hard work, I find myself in the wilderness. Well, more specifically, the wilderness which is closed off and only has one way to progress, which is inside this small stone block. Surely this next area will lead me to somewhere nicer, right? Okay, what? There is only one place to go in here, and that is up the stairs. 
Okay, who turned off the pixels? So I end up in this place called FC World, or Famicom World. Now I have a lot less bits, and even the menu has changed to fit this new area. There are also some lizard men I can talk to. Whenever you talk to them, they give you a five digit number. When I first played this, I was like, oh wow, look at this, they gave me some kind of special code. And then I talked to him again, and then he gave me a completely different code. And then I realized these people just talk in numbers. So at this point, I had no idea where I was going. This is how it started, and this is how it's going. So I know I messed up somewhere. I travel into this area called the FC Dungeon, exploring seemingly endless rooms with strange faces covering the walls. Okay, can I please be put into a room where there's not a bunch of weird red faces staring at me? Okay, thanks I guess. It was at this point that I finally swallowed my pride and I decided to use a map to get through here. Following this map, it brought me to this place called the White Desert Underground Lagoon. Okay, now we're getting really interpretive. A bunch of cacti and weird hands dot this monochromatic landscape. And eventually we find ourselves inside these non-Euclidean tunnels, which are home to but a single NPC. Still using a guide, I find out that by killing this specific NPC and walking through the right-hand side of this tunnel, it will take me to what's called the White Path. Off in the distance, you will see trees and a fire, which grows the further you travel down this path. Moving all the way to the left, you will find yourself at this... chamber... stairwell... whatever this is. And if you walk inside, the Floating Heads event will activate. This area is beyond strange. There is a fire burning in the background, there's massive limbs sprouting out of the ground, and if you walk into this enclosed space, decapitated floating heads just appear in the sky. It feels like the game is trying to tell me something very specific, but I just lack the context to understand what it's trying to tell me. Every time you enter this structure, one of two heads will appear, either a female head or a male head. This area is technically a dead end, so I guess I'm done here. I decided to go back, eventually finding myself at this giant mouth, which I walked inside. This then brought me to this weird geometric world, where I was stuck on this massive tower. After talking to this ghost with a winter hat, it teleported me down to the ground below, so I decided to explore some more. Eventually, I found myself to this door, which then led me back to the Nexus. Wait. What? It led me back to the Nexus? Uh, this is gonna take a while. Okay, as much as I would love to spend another hour exploring aimlessly, I think if I'm going to analyze this game with any sort of structure, then I'm going to have to do this in a more structured way. No more expeditions. We'll just start from zero, and then we'll use the wiki to guide us the whole time. The way I see it, the best way to do this is to go in accordance to a clock. There are 12 doors in the Nexus, so we'll start from one and then I'll work my way clockwise around the room. We're gonna start in Numbers World again, but this time we're gonna see everything in Numbers World. I would like to give a special thanks to 1AM Wolfram. Uh, they did a Yumaniki video a couple months ago, and the structure of theirs helped me structure my video better. Their video will be down below. Welcome to Numbers World. This world is filled to the brim with several number sequences. Strings of eights and nines, massive numbers that seemingly bear no overall meaning. The first major location we'll talk about is the bed area. You can reach this area by walking into the leftmost door, which shares some resemblance to the neon world we will be visiting later. All of the names that I give these places, NPCs, and areas come from the wiki itself. Also, sorry in advance if I mispronounce any of the Japanese names. Within this bed area, we find one of the recurring NPCs within Yumeniki. This is called a Tore Ningen. Tore meaning bird, and Ningen, which means human. These bird people are commonly recurring. It is unclear if these are all supposed to be the same people, or if these are just a type of person that Maratsuki has met in her life. Tore Ningen can be found in passive and crazy states. This specific one by the beds is in a passive state, unless you stab it with the knife effect, in which then it will become enraged and chase after you. If it manages to touch you while it is in this state, it will teleport you to a place where you cannot escape. This specific one teleports you to one of two areas. In the first area, you will see nothing but the hiragana symbol for A, or this other symbol, which to me kind of looks like the tops of these jellyfish we saw earlier. Stepping over one of these symbols will begin the ah effect, literally just 
A's, a bunch of A's. What's particularly interesting about this event is that the A's which appear take up the empty spaces in between the numbers that typically dot the area. The beds in this area seem to be arranged randomly. Some appear to be empty, others appear as though they are currently being used. I actually have a small story to tell you. So, when I found myself in this area for the first time, I saw all these beds strewn about the area, and for some reason in my mind, I thought this was some kind of secret message. I was in theory crafting mode, so I thought that a filled bed represented a 1, and an empty bed represented a 0, cause you know, it's numbers world. So I took note of all of the beds and I put 1s and zeros into a binary code and then tried to solve it using a binary code decoder program. And this is what I came back with. Yeah, pretty cool, right? Yeah, there wasn't a secret code or anything. The next major area is regarded as the stabbing room, as the only way to effectively see what is waiting for you on the other side is to use the knife effect to meticulously kill every single NPC that blocks your path. At the end of this room appears to be a giant blue mask, and I'll be honest, I have no idea what this means. This door surrounded by binary numbers will lead you to this other place called Lamp World, which at one point was its own world you could get to from the Nexus. If you stab the Toiriningen in the bed area and move over to the third closet, you will enter this place called Mini Hell. There is nothing of note within this area except for Madotsuki's ghost, which tracks your movement. Mini Hell is just an enclosed space. It has several connecting areas, but they all lead back to the numbers world. On occasion, one of these zipper tiles, which line the walls all the way back to the bottom right hand corner, can have a different expression on its face. Stabbing it with the knife effect will cause a gateway to open, and inside you will find this thing called Kyukyukun. The loud ominous music which once filled the numbers world has now gone silent, making the wiping sound effect this thing makes all the more unsettling. Walking all the way up the stairs and entering the door will trigger the face event. I know I put a flashing imagery warning at the beginning of this video, but seriously, for this you might not want to look directly at it. This event actually wakes you up, so I can only assume it's because this is an incredibly vivid nightmare. Not bad for the first world, right? So what the heck does all this mean? While exploring through the numbers world, I was reminded of the strict and logical nature of numbers themselves. Numbers are solid, logical, and cannot be interpreted in any other way aside from what they are. So it is strange to find numbers in dreams like this. Walking through the narrow hallways, the zipper tiles and face-like tiles covering the walls and all of the different rooms has me thinking about school, funnily enough. Is this Madotsuki's actual school? No, probably not. I think more so this area is made to represent Madotsuki's experience with schooling, or maybe even a place she lived in when she was younger, an orphanage perhaps. All of the beds and closets would have me believe that this bed area is like a barracks or a sleeping area for people. And the fact that the beds are big enough for Madotsuki leads me to believe that the other people inhabiting these beds are other children. If we were to take the general vibe of this world at face value, I think it is safe to say that Madotsuki does not like math. The Toriningen teleporting you away to this enclosed area and the hiragana symbols for A appearing all over the floor kinda reminds me of how teachers used to punish bad behavior with repetitious activity, like writing the same thing on a chalkboard several times in a row. This small enclosed room could also represent some sort of timeout area that the Toriningen has put you in. This could represent an area where Madotsuki was kept for long periods of time, which could be the reason why you cannot escape these areas unless you wake yourself up or use the metamod effect. Whenever a Toriningen catches you in its crazed state, they always teleport you to these enclosed areas. So I would not be surprised if this was a common punishment practice from the people who took care of Madotsuki. I don't believe the Toriningen are meant to represent her parents, but rather other authority figures in her life who probably weren't the greatest. Babysitters, teachers, things like that. The stabbing room has my attention, because quite literally I have no idea what to make of this room. 
the best interpretation I could think of, still going off the logic of this being part of her school memories, or memories when she was younger, this could be representative of an overcrowding issue that took place in the school she attended. Or perhaps there wasn't enough space in general. As for the blue plague doctor mask, I have no idea. As for the lamp world, this could be some kind of community park or outside recreational area that Madutsuki would visit, perhaps after school. Now, the Q-Cocoon and the face event are a little bit harder to pin down. The fact that the only way to access this area is by random chance and to use the knife effect would have me believe that this is a repressed memory. Repression is when a person almost instinctually pushes a memory out of their consciousness. Making the memory harder to access decreases the chance of those memories resurfacing and dealing with the emotions that come with it. With the name Q-Cocoon, the phrase QQ is a reference to the rubbing sound the creature does the whole time it's there. Coon is used to address younger boys or male friends, or just younger males who don't necessarily share the same status as the addresser. It can sometimes be used to address women, but typically only when a girl exhibits a stereotypical tomboyish nature. There are several interpretations I could attach to this. This could be only part of a memory. And Kyukyukun themselves could have been placed here within Marotsuki's subconscious as a means to stop her from facing the actual traumatic memory which awaits her at the top of the stairs. Kyuku could be the result of a memory. Maybe this is the memory of a male friend who Marotsuki knew earlier, which then she was yelled at by an authority figure for talking to him. This could even be representative of a male friend who betrayed Marotsuki's trust. There are so many different interpretations. I read the wiki and there are a lot of fan theories about this area. A lot of people believe this giant worm thing is specifically supposed to represent this phallic imagery, as you have to walk through a zipper tile to reach it. And the face event alludes to some form of abuse that Madotsuki experienced in the past. My only reservations with this interpretation is that you can also travel through a zipper tile to get to this guillotine world. The only thing I know for sure about this area, it's creepy. Creepy in a way that you would almost have to attach it to a traumatic memory. The door you walk through to trigger the event is the exact same design as the door to Madotsuki's room. So maybe this was a time that she was yelled at by her parents for acting out in school. Okay, that's pretty much it for Numbers World. We had some very creepy imagery and some very interpretive imagery. Welcome to Neon World. This place is filled with cramped hallways and several flashing lights. This world is also one of the most crowded areas in the game, sporting over 137 NPCs. Only the stabbing room has more at 182. In earlier versions of the game, this area was a lot more open, making it look a lot more like Graffiti World. You've probably noticed that I haven't talked about any of the effects in the game at this point, and that is mostly intentional. I have dedicated an entire section of this video to the effects of Yumaniki. The neon world doesn't possess a lot of areas of interest, except for the neon tile path, an in-between area which leads you to hell, literally hell, which is a massive place in and of itself. Throughout neon world, there are several neon tile statues, more than likely made to represent different animals. This is one of many instances of the tribal slash Mesoamerican imagery we will see throughout this game. My first thought when examining this world would have me believe that this is a city, complete with flashing lights and such. Maybe this is an arcade of sorts, the flashing lights being games and the neon entities representing people. Arcades were exceptionally popular in Japan during the 1980s, and with the presence of a console in Madotsuki's room, I think it's safe to assume she is a video game enthusiast. The art seen in this world is similar to art typically found in Paracas artwork, found in ceramic bowls, and even some of their embroidery. A lot of the imagery in this game leads the community to believe that Madotsuki herself is part South American, which actually makes a lot of sense. After Japan began to recover after World War II, there was a lot of Japanese emigration after the fall of the imperial ruling government. Not immigration, but emigration, people leaving the country. You see, before and during the war, there were heavy restrictions on who could leave. Soon after, many Japanese schools in developing countries began to form. This was called the Nihonjin Gaku, 
which literally translates to Japanese school. This was a type of school made for Japanese students to attend while they were living abroad. This would provide them with a standard Japanese education in other less developed countries. The system was actually expanded in the 1980s. The Nihon Jingaku was expanded even more, reaching over 80 schools all over the world by 1987. The designs of these neon entities would actually support this. Some of these entities resemble the pottery I mentioned earlier. Other entities actually resemble a primitive stove. So I would not be surprised if Madotsuki had lived in South America for a long period of time. This would also be supported by the pyramids found in the neon tile path. I actually want to share a crazy aspect about this interpretation with you guys. I never would have made the pyramid connection if not for the fact that on the neon tile path, it allows you to step off briefly wherever there's a pyramid. The tiles only let you step off the path when there's a pyramid nearby and nowhere else. This would imply that Madotsuki, at some point, took trips to these pyramids. Welcome to the world of the Shield Folk. This is one of the smaller worlds in Yumeniki, so naturally it will have one of the smaller sections. The only place of interest would be the gateway which leads to the Static Maze, a maze which intentionally hides its walls, making it much more difficult to navigate. The Static Maze is a challenging barrier which leads to a place called FC World. More specifically, FC House, which at the bottom you can find a demon creature. The house itself seems to be intentionally big and maze-like. The significance of the maze being a barrier which stops you from entering this house would imply that this house has another awful memory, but I cannot seem to find it, unless the demon is what's supposed to be the memory. The video game aesthetic of this area could also be a supporting factor for my idea of Madotsuki being a video game enthusiast. The actual shield folk in this world could also be another reference to Mesoamerica. Typically, in Aztec culture, a warrior would craft their own shield called a chimali. While it wouldn't necessarily have a face on it all the time, it would be typically made of hunting materials like deer skin or ocelot skin. Perhaps the shield folk world, in general, comes from a memory of a time where Madotsuki was taken to a tourist destination, in which she saw many of the natives. Welcome to Candle World. Candle World is mostly an empty void filled with, you guessed it, candles. The only notable locations is this bed which has the chance to teleport you to the staircase of hands, and then this pyramid which takes you to the checkered path, another one of the in-between areas which takes you to hell. There is also this little guy who runs around the area. You can hear him as soon as you enter. They almost look out of place, like they would be more accustomed to FC world rather than here. Technically, all of the objects in this world are pixel art style, but maybe this one's simplicity means he is not originally from Candle World. All of these candles can be extinguished with the knife effect, but if you're playing on the Steam version, for some reason this one in particular will become a flame rather than be extinguished. The wiki refers to this as a bug, so I will treat it as such. There are these groups of walking candle people, which also dot the area that seem to be already extinguished. Much like before, we see a Toriningen next to the bed, which will chase after you if you stab it with the knife effect. This particular one will transport you to a section of hell you cannot escape. Interacting with this purple pyramid will take you to what is known as the Checkered Tile Path. If you came here from Lamp World, you would be brought to the little island in the middle. Inside this closet is a sleeping Madotsuki which carries several implications. Sleeping Madotsuki or Closet Madotsuki could be a reference to her loneliness. Spending so much time in an enclosed space could be a direct representation of her current living situation. There is also the symbolism of Madotsuki being in the closet, a term used to describe people who keep parts of their personality hidden, such as their gender identity or their sexuality. This idea, paired with the fact that Madotsuki can walk into both the men's and women's restroom, could imply a sort of gender dysphoria that impacts her life. The understanding of this could also be literal. Maybe she is in her current situation because it is forced upon her and she doesn't have the strength to escape. Welcome to Eyeball World. Eyeball World is an empty void of body parts. Detached eyeballs and several severed hands sprout from the floor along with these misshaped heads called pyre monsters. Arms are typically located next to these heads, which leads me to believe these are graphic memories of times where Madotsuki saw bodies. 
or perhaps even people who were still alive but injured. The many eyeballs could also be a telltale sign of Madotsuki suffering from scopophobia, or the fear of being watched. We see a lot of eye imagery in other parts of the game, such as when you turn on the TV in her room and even Yuboa's trap. This gory area, along with footprint path A, could be attached to a traumatic memory of a time Madotsuki spent in the hospital. Maybe she was visiting a relative inside a hospital, or she suffered from an accident which caused her to be checked into a hospital herself. On footprint path A, there are these monsters with enlarged stomachs called Henkai Shita, or something that has been transformed. Remember, these are Madotsuki's dreams, so there could be things that she is remembering that aren't clear because of her childish understanding of events. These Henkai Shita could represent pregnant women who have enlarged bellies, or they could represent people who are large in general. Either way, I think any of these people could be found in a hospital, but considering how young Madotsuki is, I don't think she would be able to tell if someone was mortally wounded, and would just assume that something transformed them into this current state. Here we are in Graffiti World, my personal favorite world in the entire game, for several reasons. Not only does this world have one of the easiest ways to get to the mall, it also has my favorite effect, the bike. And I love all of the different sounds and visuals of this world. Across the world of graffiti, there are an assortment of different tiles and blocks, which when you step upon them, they each make a different noise. I cannot explain why, but the tactile feeling of every single tile have its own purposeful sound is very satisfying to me. Down at the bottom left, there are one of the two bathrooms earlier mentioned. This is the first, the women's restroom. You can find the men's restroom in Block World. Like I said, this area is the fastest way to get to the mall. By walking into the elevator at the bottom right, you can be teleported directly to the upper area of the mall, a large area in its own right. This world in particular actually sparks a larger conversation in the understanding of RPG games and how we interact with them. When we play a game like Yumaniki, we are using a computer to access the game and enter the world this developer has built. In actuality, we are not entering this world as much as we are peering into it. It's kind of like putting on a snorkeling mask and dipping your head down into the water to see what's below you. You are observing this world through a specialized looking glass, and remotely, you can move Madotsuki around to interact with certain objects in this world. But this way of interacting with this world is limited almost by design. Looking at this image here, if you thought about it for a time, you could possibly discern that it was a face, but you could never know for sure. My point is that this world specifically highlights our limited level of understanding in this world, and that doesn't only involve conceptual dreams in our interpretations of such. Just like earlier, when I was talking about aspects of the game that only the creator would know for sure, this graffiti world map was more than likely something only the creator was supposed to to see. I think this is very indicative of the overall message of Yumaniki. To understand it, we are going to have to look at it as one complete and solid experience, rather than an assortment of different events in isolation. I'm not saying this is the message of the developer, by the way. I'm past the point of looking for secret codes by now. I'm just saying that playing this game really put the concept of perspective into perspective, if you know what I mean. Speaking of perspective, I know for a fact that there is no way that Madotsuki would ever figure out that she was standing on a piece of art. If you thought that our initial view of this world was limited, then just take Madotsuki into account. She would absolutely never be able to see the full picture, because she's down there walking on it right now. Ugh, <sighs> man, all this thinking's making me a little bit tired. I think it's time for a lunch break. Hello, and welcome to Intermission 1. These will be sections where we take a break from the overall analysis of the game to talk about topics that are not directly correlated to Yumeniki. Did you know that Toby Fox, creator of Undertale, actually had a chance to interview Kikiyama? I knew that Toby Fox did some work for Famitsu Magazine, but I honestly did not know that he did interviews with people, let alone the creator of Yumeniki. And of course, he only ever asked them yes or no questions, because of course he did. Forgive me if I sound judgmental. 
To be fair, Kikiyama is notoriously known for not interacting with the public. While Fangamer was given permission to sell Yumeniki merch, the actual nature of the developer both physically and psychologically is pure speculation. I can imagine that Toby knows this himself, so I guess the self-imposed restrictions of the interview were made to increase the chances of Kikiyama saying yes, which they did. So for question one, Toby wants to know if at the time of version 10a released, did Kikiyama believe the game was considered finished or in its final version, so to speak. For a while, Yumaniki was updated, taking on several iterations adding new maps and such. So as a fan, I would imagine the prospect of a new update to the game would be something on Toby's mind. Kikiyama actually answered no to this question, which could very well mean we may get another update in the future. For the second question, Toby talks about other games like Cave Story and their presence on the platform which Yumaniki was uploaded to, and he was trying to see if any of the games on the platform had any sort of inspiration to it. The answer was yes, but really the question was if Kikiyama played any other games on the platform, so really we can't say for certain if the inspiration was there. For those who don't know, RPG Maker is a platform for making games that follow the typical RPG structure. That means battling monsters, gaining experience, and unlocking new attacks to kill even more monsters. While this method of making games is still alive and well, another subgenre of RPG games focus on things like storytelling and exploration, like Yumaniki. This question mainly concerns if there are any predecessors to Yumaniki which were more typical, like previously described. The answer was no, so it looks like the creator always had their hearts set on making a game about exploration. Question 4 is a little more personal, as it asks if the creator would ever draw pictures in their notebook before they made the game. The answer was yes, and Toby asked this because Toby would do the same in his notebook. And it kinda made me think about the creator's drive and how it affects many people from different walks of life. The drive to create inhabits many, and it's kinda crazy to see two creators bond over something so small like doodling in a sketchbook. In the spirit of this, I thought I would show some of my doodles from my sketchbook from school. If I ever make a game one day, I'll probably put these guys in it. Question 5 is the shortest one, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna read it verbatim and I'll let you draw your own conclusions. As a kid, was there a time when you tried to draw things like cute girls in a more traditional manga style? The answer was yes. Moving on. Question 6 reads, have you ever played any of Osamu Sato's games, such as Dream Emulator LSD? This game in particular actually caught my attention a while ago, but I honestly thought it was one of those ARG games that didn't actually exist, like Petscop. But I guess it actually does, and there is even a fan recreation of it you can get on PC. So I decided to dedicate an entire section of this video to that game. The reason why is because the answer was yes, so I think it could be safe to assume that Yume Nikki took a bit of inspiration from LSD Dream Emulator. The seventh question asks if Kikiyama ever listened to Amphex Twin, a contemporary electronic musician which makes a lot of instrumental pieces. Toby thought that the music of Yume Nikki was inspired by Amphex Twin. The answer was no, but I can definitely hear the similarities. The next one is very interesting, as it involves Toby venting a bit about how he felt on the release of Undertale. He wanted the game to do well, sure, but I doubt that Toby expected the game to blow up the way that it did. Quite frankly, he's right. The world of Undertale wasn't anything the mainstream video game players were interested in at the time, so the sudden explosion by word of mouth was so unexpected. Toby goes on to talk about how the initial explosion of Undertale was a bit stressful for him, because it had several thousands of eyes looking at his game. That level of sudden attention can be rough for those who aren't expecting it, so I can't say I blame him. Kikiyama answered no, and that probably makes sense considering the popularity of Yuma Nikki never really rose to the heights of Undertale. Also, I would argue that Yumaniki's popularity was more gradual, like it soon grew a cult following over time. In question number 9, Toby then asks if Kikiyama continued making art and music even though they weren't planning on releasing it, to which the response was yes. So it looks like there's a lot of Kikiyama original works that might never see the light of day. For question number 10, I have a confession to make. I'm sorry, but I lied. The truth is, Toby Fox did not just ask yes or no questions. This last question is probably the one which had the least possible chance to be answered because it required a much greater effort on Kikiyama's part. 
in a turn of events which completely contrasts the way this interview was carried out thus far, this question involved Toby actually sending reading material to Kikiyama for them to look over before they answered. This was not a simple yes or no question. This question required a much greater level of thought from Kikiyama. This man Toby Fox straight up asked Kikiyama what they would get at Denny's if they ever went, and he supplied a menu for them to look over. It was like a full on Japanese menu and everything. I didn't even know they had Denny's in Japan. What? <laughs> oh, oh the, the answer was rice casserole with three types of cheese and shrimp. This interview was one of the only documented moments in which Kikiyama spoke to the general public. So I feel like this is very pertinent to find out what kind of person Kikiyama is. From the small and vague and, well, ridiculous questions, I think we can glean that Kikiyama is an artist. An artist who cares more about making something wonderful than being regarded as wonderful because of their art. I doubt that Kikiyama will ever reveal themselves, but if they ever did, I imagine they wouldn't spend too much time in the spotlight. Back to our regularly scheduled video essay. Okay, so quick recap after that little break. We have Madotsuki, a young girl living in Japan, presumably alone. Periodically, Madotsuki falls asleep and enters her dreams, filled with many doors which then lead to many different worlds. I am going with the interpretation that these worlds are more than likely representations of Madotsuki's memories, including, but not limited to, distant and recent events which have occurred at some point in her life. Events in her life that she hasn't had the time or the intuition to process because, like previously stated, she lives alone. Madotsuki keeps track of these memories inside her dream diary. When we begin to explore Madotsuki's dreams, we are essentially at the mercy of this world. If it is too dark to see, we either have to leave or use a specific effect to make traversal more viable. These effects are found by interacting with the specific NPC attached to them. In a way, as you gain more effects, Madotsuki gains more control and the player, as a result, gains more confidence in their ability to explore the many worlds. The worlds we have talked about thus far are the Numbers, Neon, Shield Folk, Candle, Eyeball, and Graffiti worlds, in which I gave my current interpretations for their existence. Already, we have seen a massive presence of Mesoamerican and South American inspired works of art. This leads me to believe that at one point, Madotsuki's family lived abroad, and she still had the means to receive a Japanese education while living there. The exact area is unknown, but with the appearance of many different artworks and the appearance of pyramids, I think it is safe to say that Madotsuki lived in this region. Because of how abstract the imagery in this game is, I will be the first to admit that getting a solid interpretation is difficult. Other, smaller details that are not confirmed yet are, at one point, Madotsuki was admitted to a hospital, she was abused or neglected by her caretakers in the past. These caretakers take on the form of the Toreningen in her dreams. Sometimes they spawn in as crazy, or they can be made crazy when Madotsuki, for lack of a better term, acts out when she stabs them with a knife. If captured by a Toreningen, they teleport you to a secluded area, in which you cannot escape unless you can teleport yourself back to the Nexus. I have interpreted this gameplay mechanic as memories of when Madotsuki was put in a timeout when she acted out. Those are the major points of what I have understood from this game so far. And with that, we can now begin part two of my analysis of Yume Nikki. Let's continue. Welcome to Mural World. Mural World is one of the few worlds that does not have a parallax background. Many of the worlds feature the Mesoamerican imagery in their parallax backgrounds. I believe this was made to imply that the memories of her time in South America are always in the back of her mind. However, inversely, the mural world has the imagery front and center. In this specific world, the imagery has been presented in these stone walls with murals on them. On these murals lies two figures, one red, one blue, with different variations of heads. Some of these murals look like they were intentionally placed into pairs. Traveling down this sewer grate will bring you to the sewers area. Within the sewers lies this ghost, which gives you the power to transform into a faceless version of Madotsuki. The sewers themselves have these black boxes hanging on the walls. When you interact with them, black and white images flash on the screen for a few seconds. These pictures consist of a person drawn with a misshapen head, 
something that looks similar to the Henkai Shita that has its head still attached, that snake creature that has a chance to spawn on the witch's island, a person with a long right arm, an entity that looks similar to this thing we'll see later called Marsan, a goofy looking crying giant that might have wings on it, whatever this is, and two amorphous blobs. These images are all tied together with some type of body horror, to the point where people have assumed that Marotsuki drew these, and suffers from some form of body dysphoria herself. This means that Madotsuki could have reservations over the way she looks, and this could very well be the case, as there are a few effects in the game that change her appearance, such as the blonde hair effect or the long hair effect, which, lo and behold, can be found in Mural World. At the end of one of the sewer tunnels, we will meet Big Red, who will swallow you if you walk into its mouth transporting you to Windmill World. Within Windmill World, you will find this fisherman. When interacted with, this fisherman will transport you to the docks. This fisherman could actually be linked to the story of the Noparabo witches, which we will go over later. My interpretation for all of these areas would involve some form of inhibition from Marotsuki, more specifically how she feels about her appearance. The effects slightly changing her appearance would support this, as she is literally dreaming of what her life would be like if she had blonde hair. As for the reason she finds herself down in the sewer system, this could either mean two things. Either one, she used to live in some type of low income area, hence the graffiti scene on the wall, or two, this is just a metaphoric sewer stemming more from how she feels about her appearance. I think it's very indicative how these images hanging from the wall are set up like this sort of art gallery, but because of Madatsuki's negative perception of herself, perhaps these drawings are made to represent herself and the reason why they are set up in this sewer is because that is where Madatsuki thinks she belongs, which is very depressing. Let's move on. Welcome to Snow World. Here we have a world of white snow, a mostly flat plain landscape, dotted only by a few carnivorous trees and some igloo-like structures. The open flat nature of this world gives the feeling of scarcity, and the sweet chimes make the world feel calm but lonely. In one of the igloos, we find a sleeping child called Kamakuriko. Using the cat effect will make them stir for a bit, but remain asleep soon after. They cannot be awoken. Kamakura is an old city that existed in Japan from 1185 to 1333. It is known to have many temples and shrines as it was once the seat of the Kamakura Shogunate, one of the first in all of Japan's history. There is also a festival of the same name in which people would build little snow huts and eat rice cakes. The festival was initially known to be a time for prayer in hopes to have a good harvest and to ward off evil spirits. Evil spirits like the Yukiona, which can be found south of this large patch of igloos. The Yukiona is another yokai which takes the form of a beautiful woman with pale skin. Usually seen during wintertime, these spirits are known to freeze people to death if they go off into the forest by themselves. Talking to this spirit will give you the snow woman effect, allowing Madotsuki to become a Yukiona. Off to the left, there is a Toriningen walking around an igloo, and if you walk inside the igloo, the Toriningen will always be waiting for you when you come back out. Pretty creepy, but I don't think it's intentional. I think the Toriningen just spawns there. For some reason, if you stab this Toriningen and then walk into this very specific igloo, you will find it waiting for you inside. One of the farther igloos down towards the bottom right hand corner of the map contains a pool of pink water. Interacting with this pool will transport you to the pink sea. This is mostly a linear path that leads to the deeper area called Panako's house. The composition of this world invokes a feeling of peace and calmness. If the light levels and the music are any indication of how Modotsuki feels when experiencing her dreams, I think it is safe to say that this particular memory is one that she enjoys. Marotsuki more than likely went to these Kamakuriko festivals and spent time within these igloos. Perhaps the sleeping child is made to represent Marotsuki herself and how she would spend most of these festivals dreaming her troubles away. Perhaps the sparseness of the area is due to how vaguely Marotsuki remembers her time outside. Perhaps she spent little to no time playing with other children, and during the festival she would instead go inside these igloos and enter her world of dreams. 
The snow woman which wanders around could simply be a recollection of the time she was told the story of the Yukiona. There are actually a lot of references to Japanese folklore in this game, so much so that I would believe that Modotsuki's family was very superstitious. The Pink Sea can only be reached by this single igloo located at the bottom of the map. This could have been Modotsuki's igloo she made far away from everyone else so she could get some rest. And this could also be the reason why this igloo leads to such a serene place. Once you reach the end of this path, you will find yourself at Ponoko's house. Ponoko, or Ponytail Girl, is the only resident in this house when you arrive. The similarities between Ponoko and Madotsuki are uncanny. Their clothes look similar, they appear to have a similar height, they have the same shoes, and their rooms look similar, albeit with Ponoko's room looking a little bit better. The dresser is bigger and nicer, even though it kind of looks like it has a frowny face. There is a lovely window, and outside it we can see a permanent starry sky. There are plenty of books to read on this big bookcase and there's even a larger desk to hold her dream diary. Funnily enough, there appears to be a poster above Ponoko's bed. If you rotate your head a bit, it looks like Mars-san. A lot of this room is just Madotsuki's room, but a little bit better. This has led people to believe that this faraway place within Madotsuki's dreams is her ideal self. This is her ideal life. The life that Madotsuki wishes she had. This could be another piece of evidence supporting how Madotsuki might believe she would look better with blonde hair. I honestly wasn't that big on this interpretation, until I noticed this small, unbelievably easy to miss detail about Ponoko's room. And what really stood out to me was how random it appeared. You're just gonna have to believe me when I say I analyzed this game chronologically, and I did not know that Ponoko's house looked like this before I started this analysis. The detail is in Ponoko's room, and I'll give you a hint. It has something to do with Madotsuki's clothes. Can you tell what it is? On the far side of the room, right underneath the window, is a black and white checkered pattern. This is a pattern of rectangles rather than squares, but you can probably tell what I'm getting at. This unexpectedly swings back around to my interpretation of Madotsuki's shirt at the very beginning of the analysis. This six pixel checkered pattern looks a lot like the transparent background used in PNG images. I came to the conclusion that Madotsuki thought there was something in her life that she needed, a piece of herself that was missing, or even a sense of emptiness she felt that needed to be filled. This is that thing. This is the part, the transparent square on Madotsuki's chest, that is missing. Madotsuki's heart has been wanting a life like this for a very long time. Or, even more tragic, this is a piece of her life that was taken away. Maybe at one point she lived in a place like this, and, because of some random event, it was all taken away. Okay, let's talk about Yuboa. This event would just not activate for me. I literally have a 30 minute clip of me turning the light on and off trying to get this event to happen, and it just would not happen. This event is incredibly rare. On top of the 1 in 64 chance that Yuboa will appear, there is an imposed timer of roughly 5 seconds which stops you from trying to get the event to activate. For those who don't know, if you turn off the light and turn it back on, there is a very slim chance that the Yuboa event will occur. If Ponoko is not there when the event activates, Yuboa will not appear as well, which could be made to imply that they are the same person. Yuboa appears in the center of the room, and a loud ominous tone plays. When interacting with Yuboa, you will be transported to Yuboa's trap. A place seemingly located in the White Desert, a location we will talk about later. There is no escape from this trap. The only way to get out is to use the hand effect or to wake Madotsuki up. The elusive nature of this event actually leads to a much bigger discussion when it comes to finding secrets within video games. If this wiki never existed and I did not see proof of the Yuboa event before it happened, I would have absolutely thought this event was fake. I would have thought that it was simply an urban legend that didn't have any way of actually happening. Before the internet and the explosion of social media, information was transferred through dedicated chat rooms, blogs, and straight up just talking to each other. 
The wiki that I am using to make this video only goes as far back as 2019. At least, that's the earliest the Wayback Machine goes. And the absolute earliest official online info I could find on Yuminiki goes back to only 2008, in the form of a small Wikipedia page. Back then, no one had a guide to tell them where to get all of the effects. No one knew that Yuboa existed unless they personally saw them. There is this mythological nature when it comes to games like Yumaniki, and it is honestly a lost art because we have things like data miners and wiki pages and chat GPT. This supply of information is amazing, but it does come at a cost. Without the concept of mystery, when any question can be answered in the blink of an eye, why ask questions at all? Curiosity is not dead completely, but I feel it dies more and more with time. There is a sense of mystery and discovery that is becoming a lost art in games, and I think that the internet is mostly the reason for this. We are people. We are naturally curious. But more importantly, we are people who like to solve problems. With the challenge removed, we find ourselves lost in a sea of answers. Yumaniki is a time capsule of sorts, a reminder of a time when answers and the truth were harder to come by. It's funny. Even though I knew for a fact that the Yuboa event existed, when I was sitting there for roughly 30 minutes, flipping the light switch on and off, I honestly thought to myself, is Yuboa actually real, or has this all just been some elaborate hoax? Now we can get into my actual analysis of this event in the context of the game. Like previously stated, this event is very rare. So rare that I would say that you could come to Panako's house several times and never learn about the event organically. For the most part, I have been following the logical understanding that if an event is rare or difficult to get to, it is literally something that Madotsuki does not want to dream about. Panako's house itself is relatively easy to get to, after we take the pink sea into consideration, and the fact that we have to sift through this pink water to get to this house, Yuboa's trap makes a lot more sense. This is an instance of a dream turning into a nightmare. The water from the pink sea is what turns into the water within Yuboa's trap. Panako, Madotsuki's ideal self, becomes Yuboa. Everything about Panako's house is calm and borderline cheerful, but there is still this dark undertone to it. The image of this house and Panako herself potentially stems from Madotsuki and her inhibitions. This is what she wishes her life was like. Yuboa is a jump scare, but the implications of this jump scare involve the dreaded snap back to reality. The menacing eyeballs which peer into the room during the Yuboa event are made to represent how much of a hassle it would be to walk outside, and highlights that Madotsuki potentially has a fear of being watched. Everything that was nice about this dream turns sour. Yuboa's trap is the completion of this nightmare. The liquid that was once pink and pretty is now white and the skies are filled with the same imagery we see in the sewers. This nightmare brings Madotsuki to what appears to be a section of the white desert. And this white desert is one of the final pieces of the puzzle. A piece we will get to in due time. Welcome to the Dark World. The Dark World is almost impossible to navigate unless you have the lamp effect. This whole area becomes empty without this effect, and while you can still maneuver it, you will find navigation here difficult. There is only one real place of interest here, but that one location is actually the largest in the entire game. Throughout the actual dark world are these engravings, tattoo-like inscriptions on the ground that don't have any real shape. Walking through this gateway within the dark world will bring you to the wilderness, the largest area in the game. Here, there is lots to see. Off to the far left, you will see the Toraningen Party. This area is blocked off by foliage, so while you cannot get any closer, you can lure them closer to you with the cat effect. Moving right brings you to route number one, in which there are two pathways. One will take you to the barrack settlement, and the other brings you to route two. The barrack settlement is an area of small houses, and there are many Piori which wander around here. Interacting with one of these Piori will randomly transport you to a specific part of FC World. Two areas of note in the barracks are this pathway where there are many eyes watching you, and this room with a seahorse. 
Looping back to Route 2, moving up will either left take you to the fence dead end or right take you to the rave monkey box. I honestly don't know what this could be, but the imagery would have you believe that this is some kind of representations of her mementos growing up in South America. Several pictures of what is referred to as the Aztec rave monkey flash on the screen. Going left from the Dark World Gate and moving up rather than left will take you to the Infinite Wilderness, a giant looping area where the only notable landmark is a hot spring house with onsen san drinking water inside. Ignoring that and moving to this specific assortment of plants, this will take you to the Northern Wilderness. Following this mostly linear path takes you to these purple pylons, and then bring you to the staircase to the sky. Walking all the way up these stairs takes you to the Sky Garden, a wonderful and serene place which appears to be in a perpetual state of night. Moving all the way to the right, you will see a group of people staring up at the sky, and tiny dancing lights flash all around the sky. This leads me to believe that this memory is actually found in South America. Walking inside this stone chamber brings you to the Crossover Garden, in which lies these little white lily flowers. When you exit, you will find yourself transported to the ghost world, finally ending this long stream of areas. Okay, so that was a lot to go over, so let's see if we can break this down. So the discovery of the barracks might make my theory from the numbers world a little bit stronger. The crossover garden. Inside you find these lilies, white lilies, which are typically associated with funerals. So this leads me to believe that Madotsuki might have actually lost someone in her life. Everything is slowly revealing itself. I think at this point we're only missing a few more details. Welcome to Puddle World. The Puddle World is mostly empty except for this tunnel which leads to the Dense Woods. More specifically, Dense Woods A. Dense Woods B is found after traveling to the right and then back. To do this correctly, you need to travel down this road until you get to the Infinite Road. Here you will pass by these lopsided fidget spinners called Floyangs. Pass by these things five times and then turn around to face the truth. You might not have noticed this, but there is this one blue one that is next to the exit, and it looks at you as soon as you leave the area. Welcome to Dense Woods B. Not our last stop, but an important one nonetheless. All the way at the other end of the road lies a dead person. This is the same dead person we saw during our first expedition, and I believe that Madotsuki knows who this is. If you pass by the Flo Yang five times, you will be able to enter the manhole cover, and this takes you to the Rory Straw in Between area. Traveling up the right side will bring you to another secluded part of the White Desert, in which you will find something akin to the drawing seen in the sewers. This is the creature with the quivering jaw. This is yet another instance of the white desert area imagery. It's almost like the white desert itself is calling back to us and we need just a little bit more information to properly process everything. I think Madotsuki knew this person, and now that person is gone. My only question is, who were they? The next world on our list is the block world. But I believe for proper storytelling reasons, I will tell you about the forest world next, as it doesn't have that much in it, and the white desert lies at the bottom of block world. Welcome to forest world. Now we get to the forest world, which as it sounds contains a large forest of carnivorous trees. This location is the main version of another deeper area called the dense woods. The carnivorous trees in the area would imply that the memories here happened in Japan, in which Madotsuki lives now. Around this area we see one of two frogs which can give you the frog effect. The ghost scene in this forest could be a hint as to why the dense woods is one of the deeper areas of the game. Following with the other examples in this game, this world represents one of Madotsuki's basic surface memories. Things that are always fresh in her mind, but the deeper areas that require more digging withhold her painful memories. The notable areas in here is the entrance to Face Carpet Plaza, yet another connection to Hell. The forest world isn't that notable with its own locations, but it's actually an upper echelon for what is waiting for us in the dense woods A and B. Like I said, there's not much here. Let's move on to the block world. 
Finally, we arrive at the last of the 12 original worlds, able to be entered via the Nexus. Welcome to Block World. This world plays with perspective quite a bit as the layout is filled with several different blocks and other 3D objects. The appearance of these shapes being 3D gives the block world a sense of depth that the other worlds did not have. This one goes out of its way to appear bigger and 3D. The wiki actually compares this world to a computer's motherboard, and I have to say I see the resemblance. Within this world lies the scarf effect, which is needed for getting around here effectively. Essentially, you need to make it snow by using the snow woman effect, and then with the scarf you can turn yourself into a snowman. While you are a snowman, you can talk to this NPC called a Mafuriko, and then it will teleport you away. If you are a snowman, it will teleport with you, making teleporting to this upper area much more easy. This entrance is one of the many ways you can find yourself inside the White Desert. The White Desert is a monochromatic world filled with strange entities with strange body features. Leaving Block World, we step out of this mouth and arms formation. Walking down will lead us to this looping tunnel, which is actually two different tunnels. To access these tunnels, you have to stab this thing out front called a Dave Spectre. Killing the Dave and walking into the left will bring you to Manoe's area, an empty black void in which Manoe is seen randomly walking through. Walking up to and interacting with her will play this event in which an image of Manoe flashes on the screen. She then teleports away and the cycle begins again. If you enter through the right, you would be taken to this path of severed hands. Another place we saw in our first expedition. This area is a static pathway in which we can see a fire growing off in the distance. The trees and the red line that is identical to the Rory straw would indicate that this area is connected to the manhole cover area. Walking all the way to the left, we will find this empty room. Walking inside, and we will see the Floating Heads event once again. A man and a woman. And with that, I believe we have the final piece of information we need. Briefly cycling back to the person seen in the road. If you interacted with that person, you would receive the stoplight effect. This effect makes almost every NPC in the game stop in their tracks. Except for a few, including this next one. At the top of the regular white desert area is this other tunnel, in which you will find Monoko. Monoko in her normal state looks to be already scarred, like she has been in some kind of accident recently. But when you use the stoplight effect, she becomes deformed, sprouting multiple arms, and she begins to bleed from her eyes. Interacting with her in this state will cause the Monoko event to activate. In this event, you will see her full figure drawn in excruciating detail. The White Desert is the location of all of Madotsuki's pain. This area in particular, the White Desert, is uncomfortable everywhere you go. I think I have everything I need to begin my final analysis. Now that we have explored all of the 12 doors, I think another small break is in order to allow ourselves to recuperate. This will also give us a chance to talk about all of the effects in the game. Hello, my name is Nighthawk, and this is the Yumaniki 25 Effects Tier List. For this list, I have gauged all of the abilities based on their usefulness as well as how I have interpreted their existence. These effects, to my understanding, are ways that Madotsuki discovers how she can interact with slash control her dreams. This, in a way, is a method of lucid dreaming. Madotsuki is dreaming, but she knows she's dreaming, so she can make things happen by simply thinking them into existence. Let's start out with regular Madotsuki. There's nothing good, there's nothing bad, this is just Madotsuki as is. This is the baseline, so I think we should put Madotsuki in B tier making this the literal baseline for Madotsuki's forms. Some effects actually hinder Madotsuki in some way, and others are outright useless and hinder you, so those effects will naturally go underneath. The frog effect allows Madotsuki to transform into a frog and move at normal speed through liquids like Yuboa's Trap and the Pink Sea. This effect is only viable in two places, and the bicycle does the same thing all the time. 
The frog effect is found in either the forest world or the dense woods. This frog most likely doesn't carry any significance, so I am inclined to give it C tier, because while it doesn't impair you, it doesn't really give you that much. Moving on, we have the umbrella effect. This effect is pretty great. The rain generated by the umbrella effect can douse the fire in the blazing corridor, allowing you to enter the spaceship and trigger the Mars event. If you press 1, Madotsuki does a cute little spinny animation. This effect is pretty solid, and while I don't think this carries any major significance to the overall understanding of the game aside from being a respite, a protection from the rain. Rain can be seen as melancholic or sad, so an umbrella can be seen as a way to cushion the blow. You cannot stop the storm, but with the umbrella, you can brave it a little easier. S tier. The hat and scarf effect is found in Block World. If you use the scarf, you will transform into a snowman if the current area is snowing. If you are a snowman, you will teleport with the Mafuriko, which makes getting to the White Desert much easier. However, this is a very specific course of events which needs to take place for the effect to be actually useful. The usefulness of this effect is situational, but the use in question is very helpful. B tier. Next is the Snow Woman effect. While it has a similar effect of dousing the fire in the blazing corridor, I cannot give it the same position of the umbrella because it does not have an action to it, so it goes in A tier. The significance of the Yukiona is a story we covered, so I could only imagine that Modotsuki was told so many times to not go out into the snow, so the visual of the Yukiona is fresh in her mind. The knife effect has got to be one of the most effective abilities in the game, and no, that isn't a pun, I'm just being honest. The knife has several uses, such as stabbing, stabbing, and more stabbing. But seriously, a lot of deeper areas can be discovered by using the knife effect. The knife effect goes in S tier. What? No, no, I'm not crazy. I'm a completely normal and balanced individual. What? What, you don't believe me? I'll stab you. The metamod effect is also a very useful effect. It can be found in Eyeball World. You can use it to teleport yourself back to the Nexus at any time. This effectively saves you about 10 seconds of time walking back to the Nexus if you had pinched your cheek. This effect is useful if you want to explore more but have no reason to save. And it has made getting footage for this game a lot easier, so it goes into A tier. And no, the placement has nothing to do with the fact that the animation makes me feel uncomfortable. Okay fine, it goes into S tier, it's very useful. Fun fact, if you choose to pinch yourself while you have the metamod equipped, you might notice a tiny little teardrop coming from the eye. It's like, oh, you didn't want to use me? Okay, fine. This effect is found in Eyeball World, a place of graphic imagery and scary memories. The ability to take yourself back to the Nexus, while useful from a gameplay perspective, from Madotsuki's perspective, it is a way of denying the truth. The hands clench around the eye, almost trying to shut out the truth and take yourself back to a safe place, like the Nexus. While there is nothing wrong with a reset to give you time to process things, it also invites someone to simply give up when things are getting a little too intense. I am speaking completely interpretive when I say this by the way. I know this effect was probably made just for convenience. The Fatten effect more than likely stems from Madotsuki's inhibitions, making her feel uncomfortable in her own skin. You get this effect from a super skinny NPC in the docks area, so I would not be surprised if the reason for this was that Madotsuki was called fat by this skinny person. This effect is useless and it plays into Madotsuki's inhibitions. D tier. Next we have... I'm not saying that. This effect allows you to enter smaller spaces, like in the sewers or in the mountain on Mars. Very situational, but still a little bit useful. It has its uses, but it's kinda difficult to get, so put it in C tier. The flute effect is fantastic. It keeps my spirits up, but my only reservation is that it doesn't have any logical use. The fact that this effect is found in the mall could point towards Madotsuki taking an interest in music at some point. B tier. The neon effect has no real uses, and it kinda hurts my eyes when I use it. Fun fact, you actually cannot use the neon effect when you're in the spaceship event. Strange. C tier. 
The Neperibo effect doesn't have any uses, and to get it, you have to go to this very specific area in the sewers. It's useless, so D tier. The severed head effect was the first effect I got in the entire game, so imagine my shock when I randomly touched this guillotine and I saw a message that the word severed head was unlocked. The existence of the severed head effect is a bit of a mystery, until you take into account the existence of the Toreningen which chase you in this area. Just in case you forgot, my interpretation of the Toreningen are that they are not very notable authority figures that Madotsuki had to listen to in her life, such as angry babysitters or teachers who lost their temper. My reasoning for why they take you to a place you cannot escape when they catch you is essentially Madotsuki's memory of being put into time out. The horrible connotations which follow these Toreningen could be the result of mostly bad memories concerning them. The severed head being the result of this could come from a lot of things. Maybe the guillotine was an empty threat used by these authority figures. Perhaps the association comes from Madotsuki believing that she would actually get her head chopped off if she continued to misbehave. This effect possibly stems from child abuse and it hinders your movement greatly. D tier. The towel ability makes you sick and by pressing 1 you can make Madotsuki sneeze. This effect doesn't really have them any uses, and there's no real significance aside from perhaps being a reference to a time where Madotsuki was sick. So it goes in C tier. The cat effect has the ability to pull an NPC towards you. The cat effect itself could possibly be a reference to Kanan, the goddess of mercy and compassion in Japanese Buddhism. The cat symbolism is also used because people believe it draws in customers. This and a lot of other effects being references to Japanese folklore have me wondering where Madotsuki learned all of them. With all of these superstitions present in the game, I think it is very safe to say that Madotsuki herself is very superstitious. So it would not be outlandish to assume that she learned all of these superstitions from her parents. The lamp effect is found in Lamp World, and it probably comes from a time when Madotsuki saw a lamp. Okay, no, but seriously, I, th I think the lamp's existence and the dark world's existence inversely could potentially point towards Madotsuki's fear of the dark. The lamp effect is needed to explore the dark world effectively, and that level of usefulness puts it into A tier. The bicycle effect is my absolute favorite effect in the entire game. It allows you to go twice as fast anywhere you go. It is useful for getting around. It is always useful. Regardless of whether or not it has significance to Madotsuki's life is besides the point. The bike gets its own tier, above S tier. That's how good it is. Bicycle goes in bicycle tier. Okay, here we go. Let's rapid fire these last few effects. All of the hair effects more than likely stem from Madotsuki thinking she needs to change herself, and on that note they have no usefulness. So they all go into D tier. I didn't get much use out of the triangle kerchief effect, but that's just because of the way I decided to traverse the world. It is useful, as it makes you invisible to NPCs, however, with how difficult it is to obtain, I would only able be able to put it into A tier. The witch effect. It's difficult to obtain, but it doesn't have any real uses aside from activating my number one effect in the game. You find it on the Witch's Island, and I am certain it is a reference to the Hayao Miyazaki film Kiki's Delivery Service. I would talk about it more, but I have not seen it. The only Miyazaki films I've ever seen is Ponyo and Spirited Away. If anything, this reference kind of further narrows down the time frame, as Kiki's Delivery Service came out in 1989. I think it is safe to say that Madotsuki saw that movie and thought it was really great. A tier. Next is the demon effect, found in the FC dungeon. While this effect and the existence of the FC world in general is a big piece of evidence for Madotsuki being a video game enthusiast, I don't think it goes beyond this. There is a cool interaction if it's currently raining. If you make it rain with the umbrella effect and change to the demon effect, you can make a thunder and lightning animation play. B tier. The squishy effect is weird. C tier. Finally, we get to the traffic light effect, one of the most important effects in the entire game. While it doesn't have a lot of gameplay uses, like getting to hidden areas, it has a lot of interesting interactions with NPCs, and it's the center point of my understanding for this game. 
You get this effect from the dead body in the dense woods. This effect has control over almost every single NPC in the game. It changes Manoke and lets you see the event tied to her. It stops Kukukun from creepily rubbing the railing. It stops every single crazed Toraningan in the game. This effect has power over the entire world of Yumeneki. And by knowing this, I can say for sure this is the effect that Madotsuki values the most. This is the one thing that could have changed her life for the better if it had been there to stop that accident. But because it wasn't there, now Madotsuki can only imagine how much better her life would be if she had the power the theoretical stoplight possessed. Something so small could have saved lives in more ways than one. S tier. Okay, and we're back. Now that we have discussed all of the main areas, we can now talk about the deeper areas that I have yet to mention, and the implications of such. Throughout the entire world of Yumeniki, you will find five beds. Each one of these beds has a chance to take you to the Staircase of Hands. Going down the Staircase of Hands will bring you to the Dark Corridor. Going left all the way will take you to the Flaming Corridor. To extinguish the flame, you have to use either the Yukiona effect or the Umbrella effect to douse the flames. After making your way inside, you will find yourself in this completely white room. Welcome to the spaceship event. In this area, you will find this NPC called Masada Sensei who is playing this piano. Presumably, this piano is a means of controlling the ship. Sleeping in the bed all the way to the right has a chance to begin the Mars event, in which the spaceship will then crash. Walking out of the spaceship will take you to Mars, which, funnily enough, looks like one of the most photorealistic areas in the game. I think the presence of Mars itself and the presence of Mars Sun could potentially lead to an interest in science that Madotsuki has. Traveling all the way up this mountain and then going down this chute will take you to this underground area in which we will find Mars Sun. Mars Sun is presumably this alien creature which lives on Mars. If you interact with Mars Sun, they will play a piano tune. Implying that these alien creatures communicate via music. This is a bit of a stretch, but this could be a reference to the 1977 sci-fi movie Close Encounters with the Third Kind, as the aliens in that movie communicate with music as well. Ultimately, this area doesn't really have any bearing on my overall analysis, aside from it could potentially lead towards Madotsuki's interest in science. Now I would like to talk about Hell. Living up to its name, this massive red maze is filled with a deafening loud electric humming sound. This area is just unpleasant to traverse. While not the biggest area in the game, it takes an uncanny amount of time to get from A to B. Even with a map of the area, I had a lot of trouble getting around and finding any of the landmarks, and I'm pretty sure that's by design. Within Hell, you will find four geometric shapes known as the Nenrikido. Each of these are located at the end of pathways which all lead you to Hell. These Nenrikido can be found by going to Neon World, Eyeball World, Forest World, and Candle World. Within Hell, you can find several points of interest, like this Henkai Shita, one of the large monstrous looking entities with mouths on their stomachs. Stabbing the one in Hell has a 1 in 256 chance to take you back to Footprint Path A. Aside from the first interpretation of this being what Madotsuki thinks this is what Hell actually looks like, I think the overall understanding can be made when you take into account all of the places that connect to Hell. Now that we have interpreted all of these worlds, let's see what all of them have in common. The forest world makes the most sense to be connected here. The forest world is connected to both dense woods A and B. This is the area in which Madotsuki finds that dead body, and I believe this person was someone that Madotsuki knew very well. Eyeball world is filled with eyeballs and body parts. Not only do the eyeballs play into Madotsuki's fear of social interaction and scopophobia, but the presence of the eyeballs can be indicative of what happened in the forest that fateful night. My initial interpretation of the Henkai Shita are that they could have been people that Madotsuki had seen in the hospital, but because of Madotsuki's younger understanding of things, 
She does not see someone who has been mauled by some sort of accident. She sees someone that has been transformed by an accident, hence the name Henkai Shita. I think it is very telling how you can find one specific Henkai that is in hell. Perhaps this is another person that Madotsuki knew, and the reason why there is a seemingly arbitrary way for it to teleport you back to the footprint path after stabbing it is a representation of how this person has left Madotsuki. The candle world itself is not as interesting as the presence of the carnivorous trees on the checkered tile path. Those trees link this area back to the forest world. Finally, we have the neon world. In my initial interpretation, I felt that the neon world closely resembled a type of city. After spending so much time out of the city, the family wanted to take a nice car ride either to the city or back from the city. While this world isn't directly connected to the others, I do believe that the presence of this city-like area could be directly connected to the event that takes place inside the forest. These four places are all connected to the single tragic event that turned Madotsuki's life into a living hell. If you manage to find this gateway in hell, you will be brought to what is known as the Dark Forest Path. Once you reach the end of this path, you will see a single train car. Riding the train car will cause one of the many entities to appear, implying that Marotsuki has a vague memory of seeing several people on this train. When you reach your destination, the skies will turn red to imply a change in time. Here you will arrive at the Witch's Island. On this island, you will find these four witches. Based on the yokai from Japanese folklore called the Noperabo Witches. When you use the cat effect near them, their mouths begin to gape open as they walk towards you. According to legend, these creatures don't physically harm people as much as their facelessness is used to scare humans away. Continuing west will take you down a long wooden path over the water. Trypophobia, anyone? There is actually a story associated with this island called the Mujina of Akasaka. This story involves a fisherman who visits this island and then meets a young woman by a lake, and is soon scared away after finding out that she does not have a face. As for these creepy things sprouting out of the water, I believe these could be just coral reefs. Japan is known for their coral reefs, and the porous nature of them can make them a bit hard to look at. Another entity that can be seen on this bridge is called Dakishi-san, or the Drowning Man, which is kinda crazy because when I first saw this NPC, I thought it was more akin to a lobster claw sticking out of the water. Ultimately, I believe this area is an assortment of fragmented memories, places she would visit when she was younger, but also vivid memories of the folklore involved with these places. There are two ways to get to the mall directly from Graffiti World and the other by entering the elevator at the bottom of the Staircase of Hands. The area itself is large, with a diagonal pattern layout. The area feels more difficult to navigate in than it has to be. The mall is filled with mall shoppers who emit an electric sound when you interact with them, like they are more like robots than people. Traveling all the way down and to the left will take you to what appears to be some kind of waiting area. There is a crazed Toraningen standing behind the counter and cannot grab you because it cannot move. Interacting with the Toraningen will allow you to change your menu options from pink to red. The paintings on the walls and the flute which can be found in the next room would have me believe this is something different, like a souvenir shop or something. And the flute was one of the things Madotsuki was given after visiting. To the right will take you to a room with this massive red pit. Within this room we find Takutokun. This is a small geometric shape that has a red liquid inside. Once interacted with, it will begin to leak the red liquid infinitely onto the floor until you leave and come back. Miraculously, someone actually discovered that Takutokun looks a lot like a painting made by this painter named Salvador Dali a Spanish surrealism artist known for his eccentric personality. You may have seen some of his more famous work, like The Persistence of Memory, that one painting that has a bunch of melting clocks. Salvador Dali actually passed away in 1989, which once again matches our time frame. So I think the connection is solid. Surrealism in general doesn't have a clear meaning, so much like this game, you can draw a lot of interpretations from Dali's artworks. 
My understanding of this piece is that the center mechanical structure appears to be generating a human hand. Hands are notoriously difficult to draw, and they take masterful levels of practice and understanding of human anatomy to do so. I believe that this piece could be a cautionary tale of how machines could one day be used to replace humanity, taking on the roles that are sacred such as the formation of art. Or, if you wanted to get very literal, perhaps machines will be used to grow humans in the future. A machine that is clever enough to make a human hand can use that hand to perform many tasks a human would normally do. If I was to draw a conclusion from the presence of this NPC, it would be inherently manipulated by my own interpretation of this art. This isn't just my interpretation of the existence of this NPC, this would be me trying to assume the motive of this game developer, putting this NPC in this game off of an assumption that this NPC was made to represent this piece of art that was made by someone completely different. I would not only be assuming Kikiyama's understanding of this piece of art, but I would also be assuming that this specific NPC was in fact put here as a reference to that art. As far as interpretations and overthinking things go, I think this would probably be where I have to draw the line. I have no idea what this NPC is supposed to mean. We're getting into the realm of me trying to guess the interpretations of another person's interpretations. I think it's best to just move on. The roof is an area which can be accessed only if this specific traffic cone is not here to block your path. The cone has a chance of being there, so if you leave and come back, there is a chance that it will disappear. Taking the escalator up brings you to the roof of the mall. If you have the witch effect and activate it here, by walking off of the edge you can activate the flying witch event. This event solidifies the fact that this effect could be a reference to Kiki's delivery service, either the book or the movie. I would say that this falls under one of Madotsuki's fantasies, something she wishes she could do. I haven't seen the actual movie, but after reading a bit about the book, the conditions of Kiki and Madotsuki are actually very similar. They both live alone, with the only difference being that Kiki has the ability to go wherever she wants. Traveling all the way down the escalator will bring you to a manhole cover. Traveling down will bring you to what is known as the frog path within the dense woods. At the end of this path lies the teleportation maze, another area we saw in our first expedition. This ultimately leads to the FC World A. The FC World in general is a massive difference compared to what is normally seen throughout Yume Nikki. While there are places that strive for unnerving realism, and others with unsettling abstract imagery, the FC Worlds go for a completely pixelated look. The existence of the FC World could be more evidence pointing towards Madotsuki having a passion for video games. Really, the only explanation I could get for the existence of these many worlds would be the games that Madotsuki used to play other than Nasu. This could have been a game that Madotsuki played so much that she began to have dreams about it. If not being a game that she's played, this could potentially be a massive idea for a video game that she always wanted to make. The FC worlds have these lizard men which wander around. Every single time you interact with them, they will give you a random 5 digit number. This might actually support the idea of Madotsuki hating math, or even just having a fear of numbers. To be honest, even without the fear of numbers, if I ever walked up to someone and they just responded with a random 5 digit number, I probably would be a little uncomfortable. Hello sir, pleased to meet you. My name is 56273. What? 89. Two, five, two. Uh, okay. Uh, I'll be go one, two, five, six, three. Ah. The FC house is a secluded part of the FC world, and at the very bottom of this house lies the demon that looks a lot like Madotsuki, which gives you the Oni effect. Also, at the bottom of this house are four pyramids, which could be a direct reference to the Aztec pyramids. Other notable places in the FC house involve these filing cabinet areas and the FC castle ramparts. At the ramparts, these elf-like creatures can be stabbed, but the big one takes several stabs to destroy. 
The docks is the last in-between area found in the game. It is where you find the fat effect, and the reason why this area was last is because I honestly could not find a place for it. The connections to this area are all over the place. I honestly don't have an explanation for this area. The design is somewhat akin to a zen garden, considering the lights in the water and the fishermen nearby would imply this area is just a place Madotsuki would visit often. The fishermen in this area could be a direct reference to the story of the Noparabo witches. So it isn't that outlandish to assume that the docks are connected to the witches' island. The docks is where a lot of roads end. This is one of the only places you can explore by traveling to hell and going even deeper, so it could be assumed that this dark, watery area inhabits the darkest recesses in Madotsuki's mind. Without that many notable events or NPCs, I honestly don't know what the point of this place would be, aside from just being a place that Madotsuki visited in the past. What follows is my thoughts on this game called LSD Dream Emulator. It's actually kind of crazy. I made this video as a sort of appreciation post because it was something that inspired one of my favorite games, and now I am covering a game that potentially inspired this game. So it's an inspiration of an inspiration. <laughs> I should probably mention at this point that LSD actually does not stand for Lysergic Acid Diethylamide, the psychedelic drug. LSD actually means several different things. They can mean Limbo, the Silent Dream, linking the sapient dream, and many others. I won't do a full breakdown of this game, because after all, it's really just the same couple of areas repeated several times. LSD Dream Emulator is a chaotic progression of exploration. I use the term progression loosely. Even though you are technically moving from place to place, there is absolutely no logical through line to bind these events together. For the sake of viewing clarity and not having to boot up a PlayStation emulator, I am playing LSDR, a fan remake of this game that is to my knowledge the exact same. The only difference obviously being that I can just play it on PC. Link for this game will be in the description. Moving from place to place seemingly at random intervals while having such a limited way to explore this world is borderline disorientating. This game makes no sense. The only factor that ties this game together is the fact that this cloaked figure is seen several times while you are playing. If you ever see this cloaked figure, they will walk towards you, and if they catch you, supposedly, the amount of bad dreams you have will increase. This game is based off of several dream experiences, as documented by Hiriko Nishikawa. They kept this dream journal for 10 years or so, in which they detailed the many strange dreams that they had. The events which are in that dream journal were then turned into these 3D environments. This game doesn't follow any narrative cohesion or logical path. There is no beginning, middle, or end. There is just a seemingly endless cascade of sensations and events which take place. Things are happening in this game, but there is no cause, there is no effect, there is no order. I don't know if it's just me, but I honestly find the game a little unpleasant. This is not a game that is designed to give you content, nor is it meant to be played with any sort of goals in mind. This game exists, and there is nothing you can do to change it. That's not why I don't like the game though. I don't think I can articulate why I don't like this game, but I will do my best. This game is chaotic. It's noise. It's pure, unfiltered information. There is a distinct difference between noise and music that we can pick up on. I think the reason why I dislike this game is the lack of pattern. There is no telling what will happen, and knowing this, there is no reason for me to become invested into what happens next. I have never considered myself to be smart, or always logical, but I need some semblance of logic to care because otherwise I kind of feel like my time is being wasted. I thought that Yuma Nikki was an abstract game, but little did I know, this game existed. 
I wanted to take the time to talk about the Yume Nikki manga. I wasn't going to do this initially, because, well, it's an entirely different form of media, and as far as I know, Kikiyama did sign off on it, but they weren't directly involved with the creation. If you didn't know this, Yume Nikki actually had a manga adaptation, which illustrated many of the events that take place in the game. The overall accuracy of these events and their interpretations can be brought into question. Kikiyama is the only person to know 100% for sure what the deeper meanings of this game are. So, it should be stated that what we are currently witnessing are the interpretations of Tomizawa Hitoshi and Machigarita. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. While I believe that the author's intentions of a work should always be taken into consideration if known, when an artist makes something, this can be then interpreted in several different ways. I can only assume that Kikiyama believes in this as well, because they allowed the creation of this manga, and they have never definitively said what you should get out of Yume Nikki. This also applies to the manga itself, and ultimately it will also apply to my video. So, you are effectively drawing your conclusions from my conclusions based off an author's conclusions concerning a piece of media. <laughs> All that being said, while I won't take this manga as gospel, it will be taken into account for my final understanding of the game. I should also probably preface this by saying I'm not a big manga reader. I mean, like, what the heck is this? I gotta read from the right to the left? What? The events which take place in this manga appear to have taken a few creative liberties. For starters, the Dream Diary itself appears to be affected by an outside force. Madotsuki begins to notice words written in her diary that she did not write herself. Also, she is 100% trapped inside her room. She tries to leave, but the door will not budge. While the interpretation of Madotsuki being trapped in this situation does endear us to her, and it makes us want to see her go free, it does kind of take away from her agency a little bit, if you know how the story is supposed to end. The final choice, for lack of a better word, is no longer Madotsuki's choice, but we'll get to that later. Madotsuki's interpretation of the events she finds within the woods are that she is finding normal things inside of abnormal worlds. While this is her thought process for identifying other effects, I think this actually highlights a better understanding of what Madotsuki is doing. The dream world of Yume Nikki is filled with abnormal places, strange imagery, and it can be hard to process. However, there are still things within that can be considered normal pieces of Madotsuki's psyche, things that haven't gone completely off the rails. And I think that this collection of Madotsuki's thoughts in the form of these effects is what helps her in the end. The checkered pattern on Madotsuki's shirt is definitively established to be a window, a window which she can open up to store all of her effects. Throughout the events of this manga, there appears to be this giant hand, this outside force that constantly pulls Madotsuki deeper into her dreams. As far as we know, she doesn't know what it is, and it doesn't initially serve a purpose other than to make Madotsuki progress. When it comes to Yuboa's trap, there is a clear interpretation of what is going on. When Madotsuki enters Panako's house, she is standing there motionless. Madotsuki actually does not get a chance to talk to Panako as the Yuboa event immediately begins. Yuboa takes the umbrella that Madotsuki was holding and proceeds to hit her over the head with it repeatedly. In the heat of the moment, she lets out a cry telling her mom to stop, which heavily implies that Madotsuki's mother had abused her in the past. The scene ends with Yuboa taking all of Madotsuki's effects and sending her into Yuboa's trap. From this moment, Madotsuki vows for vengeance. She becomes Yuboa in a way, taking on its face and going on a murderous rampage with the knife that she found in Dark World. What follows from here is a sort of a subplot between Yuboa and Masada Sensei. Masada kinda just shows up in Madotsuki's room. Supposedly, this place Madotsuki is trapped in is a place where people can just dream forever. Panako is another girl that was trapped here before Madotsuki, and now she wants out. Panako takes the head of Masada Sensei, still alive, and walks all the way to Marsan, who is supposedly Masada's boss. Meanwhile, Madotsuki's dream world is completely breaking down, 
and in her frustration she goes on a murderous rampage. The world was made to make little girls behave, and Panako now wants revenge, just as Madotsuki wants revenge over her. Eventually, it is revealed that this whole time that the effects were just happy memories hidden within the bad, and by re-consuming them, Madotsuki wakes up. The head of Masada Sensei is waiting for her in her room, and then he tells her that this is still a dream. He tells her that this was still a dream this whole time, and the only way to truly wake up is to walk out onto the veranda and, well, this story is very interesting. I can't say for sure that I would have told the story the exact same way, but it is something that I enjoyed reading. And there we have it. I have addressed almost every single area in this game, and I have made an attempt to analyze it in some way. While many things can be drawn from this game, I wanted to go one step further. You can analyze parts of this game such as simple implications of fears, body dysphoria, social reclusion, etc. However, I personally wanted to establish a solid cohesive narrative. I wanted to tell the story of Madotsuki, and now that I have all of the puzzle pieces, I think I can finally do that. Once you have gathered all of the effects, you can then place them down inside the nexus, to which they become eggs. After you do this, going back to the real world, you will see a small staircase that has magically appeared by the balcony. I'm not going to show you or tell you how this game ends, but I think you can draw your own conclusions in that regard. I want this video to have some ads on it at least, so you'll excuse me if I'm vague about the ending. The truth of the matter is, the game itself is not clear on what the ending means. In a Q&A that Kikiyama made for themselves, they explicitly said that this game was made to be cheerful. I am left wondering why they would say this, even though the game ends as it does. This ending, combined with how the ending in the manga was treated, has me thinking that the ending is not what it seems. You can gleam a lot of things from this game, but I don't want to settle for just a few interesting ideas. I want a cohesive and definitive story of Madotsuki. While I don't think I will ever be able to do that 100%, I think with this, I can get pretty close. This is the story of Madotsuki. She more than likely lived in Japan. Her grandparents, or maybe even her regular parents, lived in Japan during World War II, and after everything was said and done, Madotsuki and her immediate family set off to live in the faraway land of South America. Her family took advantage of the Nihon Jin Gakko program, which allowed Madotsuki to still receive a Japanese education while living abroad. However, getting a proper education was the least of Madotsuki's problems. Schooling was difficult for her because she found herself in a faraway land, far away from what she was familiar with. So much South American iconography, and so many other children that did not speak her native language made it even harder for her to make friends than it already was. During her time spent in South America, Madotsuki and her family would visit many, many places. They would visit the Aztec pyramids, and they would probably witness many pieces of ancient tribal art. Growing up in a foreign country can probably put a lot of stress on someone. Things end up going wrong. Madotsuki has a hard time making friends, she begins to act out. When she does this, she is either stored in a closet or just put into a place she couldn't get out on her own. Sometimes these loud, obnoxious, bird-like caretakers at the school would just forget about her, so she would end up falling asleep. It was there that Madotsuki learned how to dream. When Madotsuki was dreaming, she didn't have to talk to anybody, she wouldn't get into trouble, she would abandon reality to live in her ideal world. The schools would suffer from overcrowding or just lack of effective facilities, and her parents thought it would be best if they moved back to Japan. Moving back to Japan, Madotsuki still had issues making friends, but she learned to stay away and recluse herself from people so that she would not get into trouble. During festivals like the one in Kamakura, Madotsuki's parents tell her the story of the Yukiona, this terrifies her enough to make her go build an igloo and stay in it the entire time. 
Sleeping soon became Madotsuki's favorite activity. If she slept, she didn't have to worry about people. Over time, her dreams became more vivid and lifelike. So she ended up keeping a Yumaniki, or a dream journal to keep track of all of her crazy adventures. While in Japan, their family still goes out on trips, Madotsuki's parents were very superstitious. They would constantly tell her stories about yokai and spirits and other evil things that would attack Madotsuki if she ever ran off by herself, which she did not do. She never went off anywhere by herself, she never sought out any social interaction, and she almost never left her home. One day, misfortune strikes Madotsuki's life. Madotsuki's parents were naturally in the front seat, and she was in the back as they were driving home from one of their trips. But it's dark, and it's raining. The moment was sudden, and at the time, Madotsuki was almost about to doze off. Then it happened. Madotsuki was only half conscious, so all she can remember is the blinding white light of that other car. Madotsuki was not the only person harmed in that accident, but she was still badly injured. Her memories are sparse from that night. The only thing she remembers with any sort of clarity are the awful things. The body in the road, the body parts sticking out of the ground, the mangled and transformed people that she saw later at the hospital, the vehicles off in the distance that were on fire, the awful disfigured remains of those who were involved in this accident. Madotsuki lost everything that night. Her mother, her father, she was alone. This time, literally. If there was no one to take her in, then she would more than likely be placed in a sort of welfare institution, an orphanage, or just a place that she could stay. It wasn't the most luxurious, but what choice did she have? It would appear that this is Madotsuki's fate. She now lives alone in this tiny cramped apartment after losing her family in a traffic accident. At least, that's what I would have said if there wasn't so many logical inconsistencies which take place in this room. Quite frankly, I have no idea how Madotsuki is the only person who survived with little to no damage, unless she didn't. Maybe Madotsuki's injuries were internal. On the outside, she looked fine, but on the inside, her mind was blank and her memory was scattered. So, she is trapped, trapped in this confined space, without any memory of how she got here. So, she does the only thing she knows how to do. She reserves herself here, and she begins to sleep, dreaming a new dream every single night. Sometimes the dreams repeat, sometimes the dreams turn into nightmares, but eventually, she finds the good memories, the parts of her life where things aren't so bad. These specific things allow her to affect her dreams, control them in some way. Logic is mostly out the window at this point, but it isn't gone completely. If you are persistent, if you pay attention, maybe you can piece together your memories, Madotsuki. Once you find all of these good memories, you can then place them into the Nexus and afterwards they will become an egg, every single one of them. Eggs have always carried a certain symbolicness to them, new beginnings, untapped potential, or in this specific instance, a new beginning for Madotsuki. With the appearance of the staircase on her balcony, the situation is clear. She is still dreaming. She might even be recovering in the hospital right now. With the collection of these effects, these good memories, she is finally able to piece together the events of what happened that night, and now she has to wake herself up. Before, she would just pinch her cheek, inflict pain to wake herself up. For a sleep as deep as this, waking will require something more extreme. So with this, Madotsuki has a choice to make. She can stay and live in her dream world forever, hoping that good fortune will come her way, or she can take back control of her life, step outside, and face reality. Her dreams were useful, but now it is time for her to put her life back together. In case I failed to properly make my argument by using the visuals, let me explain my analysis without sounding like I'm quote-unquote writing fanfiction. 
So, essentially, I know that dreams are mainly linked to memory consolidation, and when we dream, we can have experiences that are akin to past events. Marotsuki's brain isn't coming up with these dreams out of nowhere. All of the imagery from this world had to come from some past experience or event. In Madotsuki's case specifically, she is very young and her grasp on the world would be as such. She probably doesn't fully understand things like blood and gore and death, so she has to come up with the conclusions herself. We have no idea where Madotsuki's parents are, and while it may be a crazy leap to assume they are both dead, I think it is very interesting how the severed head event shows a man and a woman's head. Almost like it is deliberately saying that Madotsuki has lost a man and a woman in her life. The body in the road, the body parts in eyeball world, and the bloody imagery in general would all imply that in the past, Madotsuki had suffered from some sort of traumatic and graphic event or even suffered from multiple graphic events. I especially took note of the small detail of the heads disappearing as soon as Madotsuki walks outside, almost like her subconscious is trying to shield her from the fact that both of these people are dead. Another detail I noticed was how fragmented the world of Yumeniki was. There's forest areas, dock areas, hell can be reached via four different areas. Everything is split up, nothing is really connected the way it should be. Like, she can remember the forest area, but sometimes she only remembers the place where she saw a frog, and other times she remembers the body she saw in the road. The way that I understood this was that Madotsuki's memories are fragmented, they're all over the place, she can't really make heads or tails of events. Ultimately, there was a lot of imagery and evidence which pointed towards a traffic accident, and I took that and combined it with Madotsuki's current living situation, and I put together that Madotsuki was simply a victim of circumstance. The reason why she lives alone is because her parents died. The reason why her dreams are so fragmented is because her memory is fragmented because of that accident. The non-Japanese imagery was something that everyone notices, and after I found out about the overseas Japanese schools, I figured it made a lot of sense that Madotsuki simply lived abroad at one point. Now, the idea that this was a contributing factor to her being an introvert was something that I kinda just made up. It is possible that this was the case, but I have little to no evidence to support this. As for the ending, I might be biased when it comes to things like this, but I hate endings that are sad. I hate sad endings where the main characters don't make it out okay. I will absolutely admit that I am biased when it comes to things like this, but in this specific situation, I'm pretty sure I'm right. The lack of Madotsuki at the end of the chasm and the presence of the jellyfish would have me believe that Madotsuki was actually just dreaming this whole time. And at the end, she finally wakes up. I don't think anyone would be able to defend the staircase suddenly appearing on the balcony. This is purely an illogical circumstance, and it is directly correlated to things that happen in the quote-unquote dream world. This is also why I spend a good amount of time talking about how the game handles reality. The first understanding would be that, okay, this is real and this is fake. But I truly believe the ending is made to tell us that this entire game was a dream. I covered so many things about this game, and the craziest part is, I haven't even covered everything. There's a metric buttload of fan games based on Yumeneki. On top of that, there are several recreations of this game. There's a 3D remake called Yumeneki Dream Diary you can buy on Steam. There's 3D Yumeneki, which is literally just a 3D recreation of the game. There's also Yumeneki Online, which is playing the game with other players. I cannot stress enough how inspirational this game was to a lot of different people. Another thing I should mention is that considering this game was made by one person, and it hasn't been updated in forever, you can expect some glitches. I don't know if these glitches have been found yet, but if you bring the Takuda-kun over to this corner and interact with them, the sprite order will glitch out and they'll look like they're clipping into the wall. Another glitch that I thought was pretty funny is uh, if you have Yuminiki open and are using headphones like they're plugged into your computer, if you slightly unplug them and just leave them like that, a bunch of error windows will appear and the game will crash. I thought that was pretty funny. This has been an analysis of Yuminiki. I played this game for the first time ever this year, and it surprised me so much that I just had to make a video on it. I would never claim to be the biggest Yuminiki fan, and honestly, if I ever played you and Nikki back in the day, I probably wouldn't have liked it. I was more of a first-person shooter kid. 
This game was partly responsible for One Shot's creation, and this video above all was an appreciation post, paying respect where it is due, so to speak. So, if you made it this far, I would like to thank you, as always. But if you could do me a favor, let me know how I did. Like I said, I'm not the biggest Yuminiki fan, so how did I do? Did I do the game justice, or did I miss the point completely? Critiques are welcome and needed, so if you could help me out and tell me what I need to work on, that would be great. Thank you all so much for watching. Goodbye.